Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I think there's uh, six uh, feet of snow expected. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're very good to come. You are. Um, I was just thinking here, I'd start with telling you a little story that uh, I heard a bishop tell. He was from Ireland. Because I'm quoting a bishop, it would, you, know, you wouldn't have to tell your mother or anything like that that I just gave you a told you a dirty joke, though it's not. <laughs> it's fairly decent, and it's about, um, it's kind of like about a prayer. So one day, some of the folks who know me well have heard it too many times. Um, one day in Guinness's brewery, can you admit to knowing what that means? <laughs> in Guinness's Brewery in Dublin, they make beer for hundreds of years. At um, quitting time, there was one fellow missing. And that was shocking. And they searched everywhere to find him. And they didn't want to close down without finding him. So at last, they decided with heavy hearts, these three fellows, to go up to, to the top of a vat. It was 20 feet high, 15 feet across in diameter, full of beer. So they went up there, and as they got near, they heard muttering. But they were delighted because he was still alive. He was alive. He was right there, floating on the top. And they could, they could listen to the muttering. They went a little closer. He was praying, Oh God, give me a mouth worthy of this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my prayer. <laughs> Here in Nova, God, give me a mouth worthy of this occasion. So this subject I, I, I chose, not the easiest one, <coughs> but they say something to you about non-violence. That's what I want to do. It doesn't mean that any expert on it, but I would want you to, um, if you haven't been, to be introduced a bit to it. And it's a great, it's a great way to think and feel and act. I'll start by saying that some years ago, Daniel Berrigan gave a, a Lenten lecture at Sacred Heart Church in Camden, where I am. It was March 1st, 19, uh, 2002. By the way, Daniel Berrigan will be 93 on the 9th of May. Mm -hmm. 93. I took a picture of him that night. He was standing in front of a large mural in our church, and it had eight faces on it, three women and five men, painted by Otmar Carley of York, Pennsylvania. The men, the five men, were all murdered for peace and justice. And the three women, they died in their own beds, worn out with works of service and peace and helping people and, and justice. Now, the five men represented uh, five countries in the world and four religions. And yet they're on that mural in <coughs> Sacred Heart Catholic Church. Because what? Because they're so faithful. They were Anwar Sadat, Egypt, Muslim. Gandhi, Hindu, India. Yikshak Rabin, Jewish, Israel. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Baptist, USA. And Oscar Romero, Catholic, El Salvador. Bear together these holy, holy people. And the three women 
as they said, who died in their beds, were St. Catherine Drexel, Catholic USA, Dorothy Gay, Catholic USA, and Blessed Mother Teresa, Catholic from Macedonia. And she was the only one to visit Sacred Heart, where our painting now is situated. Now, it's a great mural. I, I never grow tired looking at it. It's just a, a great inspiration to follow paths that are dedicated to justice, nonviolence, and peace. And we do need inspiration. And we need the prayers of those holy people to steady us and strengthen us and give us the courage to proceed, every one of us. Now, nonviolence, for sure, would be represented in those three women. It would be nonviolent people. In the men, they wouldn't all have spent their lives in a nonviolent position, but like three of them would. And that would be Oscar Romero, and Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King. They were non-violent people, and the word is the better for that. Now, it was also wonderful to, to see Daniel Berrigan, and inspiring to see him, and he has been a very faithful apostle of peace. I first met him in 1965. I was young then, <laughs> 65. Um, a great inspiration to, to all of us. And I was particularly affected by what he said, something I never thought of before. And he said that <coughs> there is no, there's a word in the English language known all over, and it's a word, violence. Very clear word. But what he said was, there was no word for the opposite of it. <coughs> you think about that, that's enormous reality. There's a word for violence, and no word for the opposite. It would be like, there was no word for love, except non-hate. <coughs> it, like, it, it, it was not in the cultures, it was not in the religions, it was not, it was not there in the, the hearts and minds of the, of the people of the world. Non-violence. So we're left with that um, kind of impoverished word. And yet, inside of it, there's a dynamic wonderful um, energy and goodness. But it's an impoverished word, nonviolence. And I suppose when you look at it and think about it, that it stands for one of the noblest attitudes of human behavior, nonviolence. Difficult, demanding, redemptive, wondrous, wondrous reality. And it's extraordinary to say, and I would say that it gets, gets poor press, it gets little promotion. It's not on the lips of many people. And yet it's so profound and expresses a, a courageous level of human behavior. In all my uh, upbringing, and not that I'm any great scholar or had huge education, but in, in none of my education, from childhood through teenage years, through the seminary, <coughs> through sermons, through talks, I never heard the word nonviolence. And you can think yourself, but the many times in a sermon that you heard the word non-violence. It's a buried word. It's run over, it's covered over. 
But that's a huge reality. It's somehow a, a kind of a leper in the language. And even though, as I said, it represents high levels of love, actually love. It represents high levels. <coughs> and in all of the sermons or classroom or the seminary teachings and all of that, and from catechism to this very day, uh, I never heard in those in those sermons the word the the words the non violence of Jesus. Did you ever hear that? Well I want you to write it across your heart. The non violence of Jesus. And there's nothing more obvious. Nothing. Nothing in his work and life than his non violence. It's extraordinary that we never hear of that. It got buried along the way, and I will touch on that, how it did. But yet, it's so profoundly important. It's really, it's the peak of human love and forgiveness. Love, a very wonderful word, it's always a matter of giving. There's no love without giving. At some level, and at great levels, love is giving. But a higher level, a higher level of love is forgiving. It takes more to forgive than to, to love when it's easy. But forgiving is demanding, and that's, that's the greatest love, forgiving. Now, I want to take you to, um, to St. John's Gospel, chapter 18, and it's verse 19 to 24. I just learned where it is. <laughs> Catholics don't know where, where things are in the Bible. Well, the Baptist knows. <laughs> but Catholics are pretty poor, including myself, in telling you where something is. I don't know the numbers. <laughs> we had a priest at Sacred Heart with me some years ago, African-American, delightful priest. He, um, he taught at LaSalle, he taught at Camden Catholic, and he was a great English teacher. Now he would preach at Sacred Heart, and he would quote something, and he would say, it's Ephesians 5.4. He hadn't a clue where it was. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew. He knew those Catholics didn't know where it was. <laughs> <laughs> he threw it in there for good measure. I'll tell you, this piece I'm going to read for you is from St. John's Gospel, and it's from the uh, chapter 18 and verse 19. 19 to 24. That's impressive now. From a Catholic. <laughs> and it, the heading on it in the Bible is, um, is about, it's about Annas, the inquiry before Annas. That's kind of the name that's on it. So Jesus, God help him, he was, he was captured or arrested in the garden and then he was taken, pushed and around and taken to the high priest Annas. And the high priest, this is the, this is the scripture now, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in a temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I've said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this any way to answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. 
But if I've spoken rightly, why? Why did you strike me? Now, in this situation, Jesus before the high priest, he had three choices in response to the violence he received. He could punch back and knock that fellow's head off. Now, I'm going to digress here and say that once I had a, a verbal tussle with my bishop, Imagine that. <laughs> and only there were two bishops, and I was in front of them. And I was hauled in there because I had done an Ash Wednesday service in Camden that was connected to peace. And I held it in a cemetery. It looks like a movie. I held it in a cemetery because that cemetery was a place where African-American soldiers could not be buried. I mean, were buried, whereas they could not be buried with white soldiers. So it was sacred ground. And my vessel for the ashes was a helmet from the Second World War with a dent in it. I bought it at the Army Navy store in Camden at the time. The ashes were unusual because some of you, you, most of you here wouldn't remember, especially the students, which your mother might remember, that back in, um, oh, maybe 1970, that there was the publication of the Pentagon Papers after Daniel Ellsberg brought them forth. And so, we saw in, that, in, in his book of the Pentagon Papers that there was horrendous deception involved in starting the <coughs> Vietnam War. And 57,000 people, young, wonderful young people, died there. But it was deception. And those of you who would remember the, the Tonkin Resolution, well, that was all set up in order to have been that that President Johnson could say that an American ship was attacked on the high seas. I remember the words. So the war stopped. But anyway, because it was a book presenting the deception, I thought we should burn the book and make ashes out of the book. <laughs> and put that on. And so it was a, an evening where we talked about ashes because it was, it was Ash Wednesday. But the ashes we were talking about were the ashes of, of murderous engagements, the ashes of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the bombing of Dresden, and all the horrendous bombings that turned buildings and people into ashes. That was the kind of the idea. And then you put on the ashes, and then in, in, in memory of, and in sadness with those who died and became ashes. It's kind of like that. It was decent enough. But anyway, unfortunately, there was a, a newspaper there and camera. And the next day, it was splattered over the paper. Tombstones and ashes, all of this stuff. So that was Wednesday. By Friday, I'm in the bishops office with two bishops in front of me. Now, and they, well, they slapped the paper on the desk and explained this, they said to me. I said, it's self-explanatory. And we got on to talking about it, and, and I said, you know, that Jesus was nonviolent. And I said, he, he died for the fellow that nailed him. And my bishop said to me, he could have turned around and wiped everybody out. But I said he didn't. And I went from my, of the punch in the face and punching him back to that point that Jesus died for the fellows nailing him. Nonviolence at a supreme level of human suffering. So I just went off on that. 
I can happen, I go off on things. But I, will, I will come back. I will come back to the, um, the point I was making that when Jesus had his three choices, and that one we mentioned, and the second one, second choice would be to grin and bear it and put up with it and say nothing. And he didn't do that either. <coughs> what he did do was to challenge the, the temple guard. He said, if I have spoken wrongly, give testimony to it. Prove it. And if I haven't, why strike me? That's nonviolence. It's not, like nonviolence is not for weaklings. It, you have to have God give us the strength. We don't let people run over us without a big squeak. You know, we challenge. We challenge the wrong, but we don't put down the wrongdoer. We challenge it because the ultimate um, purpose or pursuit is truth. We must get to the truth. And so that's that's what Jesus is. And I think a pretty good example of an occasion when he acted so well and gave us an, an example, a, a good example. So I'm not saying anything against my bishops. When I got finished with them, um, I knelt down on the rock, on the carpet, and I said, bless me. So it was a, just a, a neat way to put the bishop back into being a bishop. That's what I did to him. And he blessed me. And then he put me away um, in a home for the elderly and the sick, at which time I was neither elderly or sick. <laughs> but so then I just want to say this when you engage in something like that. It's hard to punish you. It's hard. There was no way he could punish me. And he said to me, I don't want to leave you without, without a roof over your head. And I said, don't you ever worry about me and a roof. I said, I have hundreds of people who would give me a roof. I had 10 probably. But <laughs> <laughs> I told them hundreds. You know. So he put me in that place. And then sometime later, um, he met me. And he said, how are you doing? So he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. I am great. I said, I have my most wonderful time putting a place called Vianney Villa in Cherry Hill. I said, there are two wonderful women there, and they cook great meals. A wonderful breakfast, a wonderful dinner. I said, and there's a, there's a man from Brooklyn there, a priest who's in charge. He's telling us stories from Brooklyn. And uh, Joe Devlin, who was a, a, a great teacher, Joe and uh, LaSalle mostly in Rutgers, but he, he was so brilliant that the guys could never deal with him. He was like impossible because he knew so much. So I said, he's there spouting theology at me. I said, there's another priest from Trenton, he's a poet. He said, he's, he's reading poetry to me and the birds are singing on my windowsill. You know what he said to me? We'll have to get an asylum for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that, not to make much of what happened to me, but to say that when you are engaged in that, it's very hard to punish you. You couldn't be punished, and I couldn't be punished. There's no way to punish you. And so, but that's how it went, that kind of particular incident. And so it's not that it's worth telling you or not, but I have done so, now I can't. <laughs> Um, and he, he was always good to me, the bishop, he, and uh, he, he uh, sent me a sacred heart, you know. And there was one time I, I wrote something for the Star Herald, and at a meeting of the board, the Star Herald being the diocesan paper, the priest there said, he said um, that he thought I should write often by the star herald. And the bishop put a star, you know, a sour face on himself and says, I have something to say about that. And they looked at him with great consternation. And he says, 
Oh, don't get me wrong. He says, I like him. I like him, he said. I gave him a parish. <laughs> and Saladamo was this one, some of you would, might remember him. He was a delightful and brilliant um, and so forth. He was there. You know, the bishop says, I gave him a parish. And Saladamo said, some plum. <laughs> but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so anyway, I'm, I want to say that nonviolence is not for the faint-hearted unless the Holy Spirit strengthens us. We're all faint-hearted, but the Spirit of God can put wind in our sails. We won't know, we won't, we won't know ourselves. But I remember being arrested and all that kind of stuff, and I'm a, I would consider myself timid. Honest God, that's, I always was timid. But I didn't know myself when somebody started putting handcuffs on me. Like it, there's a thing rises in you that is a strength that I didn't know I had. And I learned about myself. But I wasn't a, you know, some weak, wriggling thing. I, and I had, I had something there in my soul that I didn't know I had. And so that um, maybe it's from the Holy Spirit coming to us at confirmation. And, but I want to say that to you. There's more courage to you than you know. If you were attacked in some way like that, or treated unfairly, anything like that, there's a, there's a strength that rises in you that's from the Holy Spirit of God. It's like a, it's like a sailboat drooping, and then comes the wind. And off you go, like the energy, the strength. So I, I just want to say that, and I have experience of that. I am uh, very honored um, to be here and the, almost like the feast of um, Oscar Romero, as Catherine said. It's like, a, what a holy man, what a good man, and how a wondrous example for us. And that he's honored here in Villanova and that he will, he, he, had, he didn't have all the strength he needed in the beginning, but he got it as he went along. Did. Um, and it's also today, this very day, you might know that, but um, it is the Feast of the Annunciation. It is the, um, the beautiful feast. It's a beginning, a sweet and lovely <laughs> beginning. It is so wonderful. And the angel Gabriel came. It was the beginning of a whole new history, a whole <coughs> new way this day. And and Gabriel came and talked to this young, just a girl she was, she was young, from Nazareth, and she would never have been any place. And yet here's this angel, and an angel would, would knock you out even just to see them, never mind what they would say to you. So, and he, he greeted her. Um, I think we use the word hail, but I think it, uh, the true translation of it is rejoice. He said, Rejoice, he said to Mary. And he found favor with God. And then he, he said to her that the, um, she was going to have this, this child. And she was unsettled by this everything that was happening. And it's like the first you know, exhortation from heaven was, Don't be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid. And Look at the strength that she showed along the road of her life. Don't be afraid. That was a, a most wondrous, a most wondrous exhortation. And it's a this day is a it's a starting day in in the history of salvation. It's like something extraordinary began to happen. Now Boris Pasternak. Um, great, great writer and poet, he, the one that wrote Dr. Zhivago. <coughs> and like there's, there's, Zhivago is like a, it's like, it's like a deep pond. You can read over it or you can wait with it and see the depth of it. And, um, and in that book, Pastor like says that man, that was the way they wrote then, today is not the right thing to say man, but in, gener in generic, terms he was writing it. Man does not live in a state of nature. 
but in history. And history as we know it began with Christ. It's a profound state. It was a, that, that entry into this planet of the divine um, representation changed history. It's a whole, a whole new <coughs> thing happened. A whole new thing. And it's quite amazing to, to look at how um, all these emperors and so forth are nothing more today but the, a dead head on a coin. That's all they are. But look at Jesus. Life everywhere. Celebrating, renewing, strengthening. And so it's, it's quite extraordinary that, that what, what history was changed by this intervention. So we're in AD now, we know that, we on past BC, and it was a, t a time that hope began seriously for the world. So it's a, a marvelous, a marvelous announcement. Now, the, I mentioned how the first exhortation was not to be afraid, and it's very good for us to think that fear, fear, F-E-A-R, fear, that that is the worst emotion in the human lineup of emotion. It's the worst one, and it causes, not that it causes damage, it, ca it prevents good from being done. That's what I want to say to you. To, get, to, to realize that. And it's the, as in the deadliest of emotions. And for nonviolence or the absence thereof, I want to say they're both terribly related to fear. They are terribly related. I would say that God alone could know the amount of good that was never done. And the amount of good that's not being done. And the amount of good that never will be done because of fear. People are held back because of their fears. <coughs> and the good that's in them doesn't get the, doesn't get the, the encouragement, the strength, the fortitude to be used and activated. Fear is deadly. It prevents good people from doing more good. They're afraid of consequences. And I, I would say that governments are very happy to have you afraid. They are. There's a lot of money in you being afraid. There's a lot of jobs in, in dealing with that fear. And they, they like that fear and we're going to be attacked and then we'll get your your son or daughter out there to defend. There, this fear this is a huge thing. It is, and so may God and the Holy Spirit of God pour into your own heart and mind a great energy of, of courage. Courage, great, great word. That you would be encouraged and that you would not lose your way because you were afraid. <coughs> I, I just want to say that to you. So you look today at, at Homeland Insecurity. <laughs> they're making like there's so much money involved now. You look at the look at the budget for Homeland Security. It's billions. Now at the airport, if you have a little piece of paper in your pocket as big as a stamp, you must present. It is crazy. See now we build in that fear, but it's lots of jobs. That's the issue. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Dealing with your fear. And and then even even not just only dealing with it, but increasing it, your fear. So it's it's there's a lot of a lot of jobs in terms of that. And a lot of money being spent on it. Now like the, <coughs> the, the word from, from the angel was do not be afraid. And I, I looked it up, and this little piece of it you will remember. That in the Bible, 
even you Catholics would remember that I said that in the Bible we are told not to be afraid 365 times. That's an easy one to remember. <laughs> 365 times in the Bible it says, do not be afraid. And Jesus, I don't know how many times he said it in his, in his journey of three years, but so many times, fear not. Why are you, you afraid? Why are you afraid? Do not, do not be afraid. And with Jesus coming, he took death by the throat and choked him. He, he got the better of it. But where's our fear? Where's our so, but we do need that courage to act, to act courageously and non-violently. But we need that courage to do it. That's what I'm trying to say to you. But, and they, Jesus over and over and over again, he warned us not to be afraid. And he is our savior. So ask the Holy Spirit to pour, pour good wind in your sails, give you strength, Give you energy, give you spirit. That word, great word, spirit. Yeah. But this nonviolence, we have <coughs> ignored, buried, and yet it's the central core of the teaching of Jesus. There is nothing more extraordinary that Jesus said or did than to act nonviolently on this planet. Nothing. It is the core new way of dealing with it, dealing with life. And that nonviolence, acting nonviolently, is redemptive. It saves us and those we try to work, to love. It's sometimes not easy. Sometimes not easy. And Jesus said, um, like, do not kill your enemy. Love your enemy. Imagine that. That's revolutionary talk. Love your enemy. And the, the great hope is that if you do, you, you lose enemies. They will become friends. True. And that our lives must be geared that way, that we could somehow or other, by the grace of God, help to, to change people from being enemy or being against us to being with us. And nonviolence never in, is engaged in putting anyone down. Even the worst, even the worst racist that you put it in. No. Because no, if, you, if you are successful in putting that person down, then you become violent. But if you're nonviolent, there's transforming power going on. And the grace of God is with you. So it is a great thing to think about. Jesus would say, don't be, don't be angry with anyone. Avoid the violence of language. That little piece of flesh that God put in your mouth. <coughs> it could be a weapon sometimes. And it would slice people in two. So it's a dangerous, it's a wonderful gift, isn't it? But then you could use it in a way that would, and sometimes kids are very cruel. They haven't learned yet. They're asserting themselves too much. And sometimes, uh, it's like Seesaw, I can put you down and I go up. So they need to learn that, that I do tell them that. At, at times I do. So Jesus, I would say, is the example of nonviolence. You know how you understand that? He took the blame. It's a big thing to take the blame. Like you watch kids and they say, she did it, I didn't do it, he did it. But with Jesus, Jesus took the blame for every single thing we ever did wrong. And made nothing of it in order to save us, because he loved us, because he loved us. He was vulnerable, as we know, as a lamb. We say, lamb of God. Nothing more vulnerable than lambs. I had no lambs there. 
but that will bite you. <coughs> you would run. So he was uh, he was a whole, he, his his own body was was presented to those who violated it. Like simple and open like a lamb. I sometimes sometimes think of of Jesus like like he was he was he was cotton wool. Like if somebody has a wound, there's two kinds of wool. One is cotton and one is wire scrapes. Scrapes, so they, they, it makes the wound worse. But what the cotton wool does, it absorbs the corruption and brings about healing. As I think of Jesus, he was like that. He was absorbing the badness of all of us into himself and taking the blame and the punishment. There's nonviolence at its, at its best. Not the steel wool scraping, but the cotton wool absorbing. That's what it was like. It was. But speaking of nonviolence, he was love at its ultimate point. And in, in, in thinking of following the example of Jesus, you all, many of you would have heard G.K. Chesterton's famous statement. He said, the church's ideal has not been tried <laughs> and found wanting. The good way that Jesus laid out has, hasn't been tried and found wanting. And Chesterton says it has been found difficult and left untried. Very true of us, isn't it? <coughs> Only the saints tackled it in a, in a, in a big way. So, I suppose in, in talking about nonviolence, we would, it was mentioned today in the introduction, the name Gandhi would come up. Like he was so, so extraordinary. And he is the, the shining example of hope and direction. And you know what? You could learn a lot about Jesus by learning what Gandhi said about Jesus. He had the most, the highest praise for Jesus. You would, you would be, you would be, um, you would enjoy reading what Gandhi said about Jesus <coughs> and how positive he was and how praising in his way of God. And he was a Hindu, and so he did say that. Um, to 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 read him. He says, Gandhi says, that Jesus is ideal and wonderful. But you Christians, you are not like him. <laughs> <laughs> you are not like him. And particularly it would be in the area of how we have been pulled into and we have been indoctrinated into the value of violence at every level. That's what we told. And it's not true. Looking at Gandhi, his people were, were oppressed by the the by Great Britain entering entering India and taking it over. Taking taking uh, independence away from the Indian people. So, I was thinking to myself, every one of those sort of, that might be true to say that, but a great number of the soldiers that afflicted the Indian people and oppressed them and took away their rights, a great number of them would have a baptismal certificate. They would have a document proclaiming that they were baptized and entered into the life of Jesus. And they had, they were doing that and getting paid for it. 
So it's an incredible kind of thing to think about, and that would be a this wonderful man, Gandhi, who would who would know and who would try it and who would win. <coughs> and he lost hardly any people. I saw a comparison, I don't remember, between the taking over independence from for Algeria and taking over independence for India. And like it was hardly anything that he lost compared to what the, the, it, what happened with, with weapons. So he, he proved the power, the power of the human spirit, the, the power of non-violent action. He proved it. It was brilliant in creating strategies and different things, but he laid a, a model for the world. He began in South Africa, there were, were Indian people, and. He was there for a year or so, and he went back there and worked. But he saw what was happening to Indian people in South Africa. And South Africa was a terrible place. And the great man, Nelson Mandela, was very affected by Gandhi. And look at that wonderful levels of reconciliation, which you could see was impossible. Reconciliation was brought about and brought about by that non-violent attitudes. Nobody put down, reconciling, healing, forgiving, not getting even. Look at it, it's there in front of us to see what happened, what great things have happened, and how Gandhi's teaching and his spiritual life and his great, his great man of prayer, so his spirit could be, could be activated and help other people. So it's, it's great to think about that. And um, you get to, to thinking that this reality of nonviolence is a core reality in the Christian religion. And it's central. It's not like some side issue. It's central to the, to the new world, the new world of love and forgiveness. It's, that's what Jesus came to do and to die for. And so we could be saying like then, what what happened? What happened at all with that great, 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 great example that that Jesus uh, left us? What happened? Now we have to take a look at that. The there was non-violence in the Christian church for 300 years. There was no promotion of violence in any teaching or writing in the first three centuries. They were following what Jesus laid down for us. They were following it. And they were following it in, in a, an atmosphere of brutality of the Roman Empire. It wasn't some joy riot. It was not. It had to sort of they had to trust completely in the, in the teaching of Jesus. They had to get courage and proceed. But they did it. Now, the last, I, I just learned this yesterday. They, they, the last Roman emperor was Romulus Augustus. Probably because it was Augustus and I'm in, you know, Augustan territory here, I can bring that up. <laughs> and he died in 476. That's a long time after Jesus, isn't it? 476 AD. Now, 150 years before that, that we had an emperor, and his name was Constantine. And he was he came into power in 307, and he um, finished up in 337. But, that's, that's 30 <coughs> years. Um, now in 313, that's a, a date that you should know, 313. On that date, that Constantine established the, the Edict of Milan. If you're Italian, you know where Milan is. Milan, the Edict of Milan. And in the Edict of Milan, 
he legalized Christianity. He made it legal. Before that, it was a persecuted um, religion. It didn't have the affirmation of the state. It was, it didn't have it. But in 313, he, that Constantine became a Catholic, and everybody thought this was the greatest thing. He became a Catholic. Now Catholics are in power. We have one of our own at the top. And so this is great. It was the end of greatness. It was. It was. That's, that's what's so extraordinary about it. It was the, the beginning of the end for the church's nonviolence. It was the beginning of the end of the church's nonviolence. With that, with, when Constantine made it easy for everybody. And then he was such a nice fellow. And Christians hadn't got into the army, and they weren't in the army before. They got into it with this nice man that became a Catholic. Like it, it was an incredible thing to think. You'd think it was a great thing, a blessing from heaven. But it was not. It was not. And the, the, great, the great example that Jesus laid down for us, the great truth that he gave us for his life and his suffering, it was the end of it. No more was a justification of, of war, justification of participation in it, and justification of the good that was thought to be done. All of that big, made big trouble. And look where we landed. You know where we are. In trusting in the God. Look where we are. Look where we are. It's like horrendous where we are from. And you just have to think like of how could we ever, how could we ever get to in 1945 to drop an atomic bomb on the children? How could we ever do that? And not, that's not the worst of it. There will be millions of Christians rejoicing in it. Millions of them. How could we get to that blindness? How could we not feel for the children? How could we be so blocked in our minds and hearts that we could, we could do that? And I've heard people, even though Eisenhower, you know, he was a general, so he could know some things. And he was against that bomb being, being dropped. He said, we don't need to do it. Japan is on its knees. And yet they did it. How could we ever get that far afield? Some sort of terrible blindness that came upon the people. You only have to think of that and the incineration of little children. You could see from the, from the oil of their bodies, their there, there would be an imprint on the sidewalk if they were incinerated. And we did it and weren't sorry for it and never said anything about that. Far from <coughs> Nelson Mandela, you see that kind of idea of reconciliation, admitting them were wrong. When you get so big, you can't bend. Just very, very, very sad. Very sad. Now, on that day, it was a uh, August the 6th, 1945, and August the 6th is a, those young, intelligent Catholics in front of me, they, they would know that it was Transfiguration Feast Day. It was a wonderful feast up the mountain. It's the preview of the post-resurrection, where the face of Jesus shone like the sun. It's a preview. Glorious day on the mountain. That's the day the bottom fell on, the, on that particular day, August the 6th. Now, I was reading that, that on that day, that Colonel Paul Tibbets, Colonel Paul Tibbets, in a plane named Enola K. Tibbets, it was called after his mother. The plane made by Boeing that went out there and dropped that bomb was called after this Paul Tibbet's mother. It, it, 
it's, it's hard to comprehend that. It's hard to get to that, that realization and what it was going to do. I didn't need to do it. To assert power, it was done for it as a statement to Russia, the Soviet Union. It was like not done, and they sacrificed every single person. And then we did it again. We did it twice. What do you say to me? I'm going to go over time. Just to make sure this is Q&A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can get carried away. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to think about that. He, he came to Canada a couple of years ago, this Paul Tibbetts, and he, he went on the, what is it called, the, the US, US New Jersey on the river, and he was whining and dying and applauded and with standing ovations and everything. And I wrote a letter about that, that I was upset. And I got a letter from some person in Philadelphia, I'm sure he was a good church-going man, but he beat me up badly from ever daring to say anything against this man. I didn't say very much except that he was upset that he was, he was here. So anyway, and, and if a woman tells you that <laughs> Let that to, to her heart here. So anyway, I, I could like I think I didn't, didn't quite finish this, but I won't. I leave it. I leave it. And um, I just want to say that we should say thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for Mahatma Gandhi. Thank God for Oscar Romero. Thank God for Martin Luther King. If you want to read about nonviolence. You can also read Martin Luther King. And he just heard it in Philadelphia. He's here in Crozier Seminary. And then he got in contact with people who knew of Gandhi, and he was absorbed with and transformed with it, and lived it, and died. That's, that's the wonderful examples of beautiful people, men and women, who stood up to that. So anyway, um, I will. Um, read the last line of this. Um, I just want to, to, to say, it says here, it's the last line, listen to Gandhi. Jesus expressed as, as no other could. This is Gandhi. Jesus expressed as no other could the spirit and the will 